What the hell is going on? Hello, this is Sovereign CEO, and I'm your host, Caleb Jones. And today we're going to talk about what we always talk about, how to develop quickly your own location independent business so you can quit your stupid nine to five job and live a free lifestyle and perhaps move to a less bad country or at least set up an international backup plan and do all these things for very little money because these things don't cost a lot of money. And Sovereign CEO, of which you can now see the official logo there, right there, there, to differentiate from my other brand, which shall remain nameless, is the company that helps people who are not seven-figure earners. You can be a normal, middle-class person and take advantage of these things. Uh, over the weekend, I did a seminar here in Dubai and a mastermind here in Dubai, and it was great. These are always a lot of fun. I might do regular seminars and or masterminds here in Dubai now that because I, I live here and I have to go anywhere. So maybe I'll do another one uh, in January. I haven't decided. Um, <clears throat> we'll get started in a few minutes of the official stuff. I am in, I got to get my stuff together. I have visual aids, not aids, visual aids that I'm going to show you in this particular live stream slash video. Um, I am in severe pain. Uh, I had my fourth physical therapy session to deal with my inflamed, torn tendons in my elbows. And every session I have hurts worse. So today it was so bad. The guy basically tortures me. It's like, you know, stringing you up in a rack. He would pull my, see, it hurts just to do this. Pull my arm up like this and jam his finger into the tendons into my armpit. Like, like, not like, <laughs> like, Argh! I screamed so loud. I'm a little verbal, as you might tell. I screamed so loud in, in searing pain that they heard me from down the hall. I'm also, you know, I'll come independent, so I don't care what people think. So I'm like, ah! And so when we're done, I'm screaming for like a half an hour. Uh, I was great. So when I left, I go all the way down the hall to the reception. So she's like, are you okay? We heard you screaming from down the hall. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll, I'll be sore tomorrow. That's fine. She goes, do you want some water or something? I said, yeah, I'd like some water. Thank you. So it's great. So now the good news is my test to see if these tendons are healing is I do this and I twist my wrists like this. And that way, see now before, a few weeks ago when I did this, I could feel pain down there. This one, I feel no pain. This one, I feel just a little teeny bit. So I'm getting much, much better. And you can tell, um, <clears throat> I could do a whole live stream on this. I don't care. But uh, this is exacerbated by the fact, this problem I'm having is exacerbated by the fact that unlike most men, most men have weak lower backs. That's why men have back pain. They go, oh, my back. Most men my age have weak lower backs. I have a very strong lower back. I have a comparatively weaker upper back for some fucking reason. I don't know. Maybe because I sit and type a lot and I hunched over and I, I'm, I'm losing my posture. I don't know. So I have to do all these exercises at the gym to strengthen my upper back. So I'm constantly pulling my shoulders back like this. He's like, whenever you pull your shoulders back and then you stick your head back and make a double chin like this. So I'm working like this. It's great. So I sit, my walk, I'm doing all this stuff. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. Getting older is awesome. So, um, <clears throat> hang on a sec, let me drink water. <clears throat> let me double check the technology, make sure we're working. We are. If you guys could put the number two in the chat to confirm you can both see me and hear me, that would be wonderbar. And then we will get started in about a minute. I have two big topics today. Big topics. One of these topics is something I'm going to really like link to because it's something that comes up a lot. Very similar to the 2% rule, but it's a little different. Cool. All right. Thank you. I see him. Good. Awesome. All right. Cool. Hang on a second here. Yeah, there's something I'm going to show you. I want to show it to you right now, but there's a story behind it. So I have to tell you the story first. <clears throat> you know, I might just roll into it. Let's see how we doing in here. Let me double check. Let me good. Yeah, I think we're good. All right. God damn. I am as sore as I have been in like years. I mean, I could lift heavy and not be this sore. God damn. When I sleep, I sleep on my side. I sleep on this side. And so last night I was sleeping on the shoulder and it hurt. So I had to sleep on my back or sleep on the other shoulder for the first time. And it just, it's great. 2023 is the uh, year of transitions and problems for Caleb. But 2024 is almost here. Can't wait. All right. <clears throat> First thing we're talking about today. Um, 
I have never talked about this ever publicly. I've never told this story. True story. So you need a picture. Picture it. So uh, those of you who are my age, <clears throat> you were Golden Girls. Remember that show? Go. I watched it in high school. Golden Girls and the the shortest, angriest old lady, Sophia. She always talked about about Sicilian stories. She would say, "Picture it, Sicily, 1921. A man is working." All right? Okay. So picture this. <clears throat> it is December of 1984. Not the book 1984. This is real life. I actually lived through 1984. So this is December of 1984 at Our Lady of the Lake Private Catholic School in Lake Oswego, Oregon. Yes, I had a, a wonderful, exciting childhood, as you can tell. And I'm in the classroom. <clears throat> I am in seventh grade. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hang on a second. God damn it. I'm in seventh grade. Uh, I'm in the back of the room because I was a lissig. I'm like, I'm smart and everyone's dumb. Everything sucks. Like a lot of you. Horrible attitude. Um, seventh grade was the year I had the worst attitude of my life. I was a little shit when I was in seventh grade. I was a little turd. I was like, this sucks. This bullshit. Like most Gen Z and a lot of millennials are now, like their whole lives. That's how I was for about a year when I was in seventh grade. So how old was I? I was about to, uh, what? What is seventh grade? That's about... Let's see. Freshman is 14. Eighth grade is 13. So 12. So about 12 years old. Okay. So puberty just, just about hit me in the face. That's 12 years old. And we're having something called junior achievement. Some of you know what that is. That's when you have a real live businessman or businesswoman come into your classroom and teach you about business. And I thought it was fucking great. I'm like, this is great because school, I hated school when I was a little kid. High school is not all right, but when I'm a little kid, I'm like, this is BS. Why do I need to learn this stuff? <clears throat> so now I have a, there's a guy, a businessman in the front of the room wearing a suit and tie who's actually a real life businessman who makes money in business, teaching us real business stuff. I'm like, this is fucking great. Why can't school be like this? It should be like that. But anyway, so one of the things you do in, in junior achievement, at least he did back in 1984, was they would ask you, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? And so you have these guys, the guys say, oh, I'm going to join the army. And some girl, like, there's always one girl in class. I'm going to be an attorney. Okay, great. She's going to be an attorney. I'm going to be a rock star, and I'm going to be a this. And every once in a while, you get a guy who wants to go in the trades. Like, I want to be a mechanic. I want to, you know, work on cars and, you know. And so what they do is you specify what you want to do for a living when you grow up. And they find a company or companies, and you write a letter you just you write a generic letter to whoever this person or company might be saying, I want to do this. I want to be a soldier in the army, or I want to be a mechanic. Dear Mr. Mechanic, I want to be a mechanic. No, no, no. You write a letter. It's not to a specific person because you don't know where it's going to go. The junior achievement people, they figure out where to send it. Okay. So I wrote this little letter. <laughs> I don't remember what I said. <clears throat> Something about... Um, I wanted to be, and I've mentioned this before, when they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I wanted to be a writer. And I'm very fortunate enough to actually, as an adult, be the thing I wanted to be when I was a kid and make money and make a living doing it. Um, made a lot of, lot of money writing, a lot of money. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, one of you is asking, can you give a link to the page for testimonials? If you go to calebjones.com, there's a testimonial click, right? You can link right there as pages and pages of testimonials. So um, um, so I wrote it. I said, I want to be a, and now this is when I was 12. I thought I wanted to be a science fiction writer. What I really wanted to be was a fantasy writer or a business writer, nonfiction writer slash fantasy writer. But I was going through a little phase where for some reason I wanted to be a, <coughs> I wanted to be a, <coughs> hang on. Just came off a of business builder meeting, so my, my voice is leaving me. I thought back then I wanted to be a science fiction writer. <clears throat> now, as I got older, love science fiction. Read a lot of science fiction. Science fiction is a shit when it's done well. Today, collapsing Western world, they can't make science fiction anymore. They, it sucks. It all sucks. It's all horrible. But back in the 80s, science fiction was good. Later down the road, I realized I really preferred fantasy <clears throat> for whatever reason. It's a personality thing. So, um... I wrote, I, dear, dear science fiction person, I want to be a science fiction writer. 
and I write a little science fiction, and I want to grow up being a science fiction writer, because I was a little nerd. And so the uh, the businessman would we'd write our letters. The businessman came around and gathered up all the letters and took them and said, "Okay, um, we're gonna you know we'll be back in January after the Christmas break, and we're gonna bring you what these people send back to you." Okay. So I uh, didn't see him for several weeks. Uh, you know, more weeks of boring school. Had Christmas break, 1984. What did I get for Christmas 1984? I probably got uh, Megatron. I got a lot of Transformers. I probably got Megatron and Skywarp and Wheeljack. I remember the first three Transformers I got. So I, I was in a poor family. Each kid got three presents because my parents couldn't afford it. So my three presents one of those years, 83, 84, 85, was those first three Transformers, which I still own. They're in a storage unit in the United States right now. The original Transformers I got back in 1984. Um, yeah, that's about right. That, that's about the correct timing. So came back in January. Um, we're sitting there one day and after break the in j- late January summer. So January this is 1985 now. Okay. I'm sitting there with my, you know, stranger things hairdo. I mean, I, I literally look just like that kid, stranger things. That was literally me. The main kid, stranger things, the first season where he has that bowl haircut. Uh, that's literally how I looked with the same shirts with the, like the gray stripes. So it's white with gray stripes. Those eighties, early eighties shirts, a little alligator. That was me. And my mom couldn't afford to get, take us to the hairstylist. So she would cut our hair, like literally put a, you know, just like snip, snip, snip. It's hilarious. So um, I'm sitting in the back room, all pissed off, you know, because I was back then. And um, the guy comes in, the businessman with his little assistant comes in with a big box of stuff. He's like, well, well, kids, you all got responses. This is going to be awesome. So he go to the first kid, and the first kid who wanted to join the army, this, he gets this giant box, this big box. And the, and the kid's like, this is great. Opens up the box, and there's all this army shit. These brochures and pictures, and he got a little pin. And there was another kid who wanted to be a police officer. And so he got this big packet of stuff. And he opens up all this cop stuff. He gets a badge. He wears a badge, this big shiny like cop badge, and stickers, and all these books. And then the, the, the one smart girl who wants me an attorney. She gets all this attorney shit from this famous law firm in New York and all this attorney. And she has these like books, like fucking law books. She gets books. And all these kids are getting all the, it's like Christmas. And all these kids are opening up all these boxes. And I'm sitting there in the back. I'm like, whoa, this is awesome. I can't wait for my box. This will be great. Woo. And so um, I'm waiting and waiting. And they kind of go from the front of the room to the back. Sat in the back room by choice because introvert. And um, so I'm like waiting patiently and like, man, this is cool. I can't wait. I can't wait. Maybe I'll get a fucking spaceship. Maybe I'll get a Star Destroyer in my box because I asked to be a science fiction writer. This will be awesome. And I'm like, I'm getting all excited because I'm like, finally some excitement in school because school sucks. So the businessman, I forgot his name. Really nice guy. I remember his face. I don't remember his name. This was you know, 30 years ago. So he comes to me, He walks over to me. And, and he's got nothing in his hands. He's like, so Caleb, uh, i got to be honest with you. Um, we sent off your letter, and you didn't get all this stuff that they got. You, didn't, you just didn't get that. I'm just I'm being honest. You didn't get that. You did get something, and it's very little. It, it may not seem like much, but I have a feeling that once you see what this is, it'll be better than what all these other kids are getting. He goes, don't tell him I said that, but this is what you got. And he reached into his pocket, his inner pocket, he pulled out a little envelope. Not an envelope, like a little envelope, like, you know, those little tiny ones that you sell like little Christmas cards in. Maybe they still do. Little teeny tiny envelope. This little brown, beat up, little fucking envelope. Like, what the fuck is, what? He goes, here you go. And he leaves on the desk and he leaves. I'm like, Really? And literally right next to me, kids like, man, this is great. They have all these books and brochures and pictures. And, you know, one girl wanted to be like a dancer or something. She had this famous dancer with her autograph. And and I get this little tiny fucking envelope. And I said, there better be $100 in this envelope. This is bullshit. And, and it's an address from New York. That's all. It doesn't even show who it's from. It's not from a company. It's just a little envelope with this little, someone typed on a typewriter. Like, man. Of course, I'm like, of course, because I have a horrible negative attitude back then. So I open up the envelope. 
Now, before I tell you what's in the envelope, I'm going to ask you guys in the chat. I'm going to ask you a question. See if you can figure this out. See if, we, see if we're, like, simpatico with this. Who is, arguably, who is the person that most people would consider to be the greatest science fiction writer of all time? I'll wait for you guys in the chat. Who would most people consider to be the greatest science fiction writer of all time? And again, this is 1984. So you can't list some, anyone who got famous after 1984. I'm not talking about recently. I'm talking about of all time. Like number one. If you're like the top one, two, three, who do you think that person is? Who would you guess? James Cameron is a director. <laughs> <clears throat> Paulo, uh, I'm going to see a few names before I say anything. Okay. Ooh, some good guesses. Good guesses. Stephen King is not a science fiction writer. Tolkien is not a science fiction. Sci-fi, not fantasy, not horror. Okay? Not movies. Not movies. Books. I should, probably should have specified that. Books. 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 Okay. I'm going to click a few names. One of you got it. Okay, but hang on. So let me click a few names here. Frank Herbert, good guess. Of all time, no, because he only did one thing, but yes. Philip K. Dick, good guess. Um, okay. Asimov, Arthur Clock, Heinlein. Probably the best guess on here. Those three are, yeah, it's one of those three. Those three are probably the top. Yes. One of you said Isaac Asimov. H.G. Wells. So H.G. Wells is the original sci-fi writer. I don't think he's considered the, the, the greatest sci-fi of all time. All right. Frank Herbert. Another one. Cool. Isaac Asimov. All right. So we've got three Isaac Asimovs, a few Frank Herberts. Okay. I open up the envelope. It's this little tiny letter. It's about this big. It's not even the size of a piece of paper. It's typed on a manual typewriter. With a, with a signature, and it's from Isaac Asimov. And I didn't know this at the time, but Isaac Asimov, I'm going to try not to get emotional. I don't get emotional about things. This, this makes me emotional. Isaac Asimov typed every... Isaac Asimov wrote more sci-fi books than anyone in human history. He's written like hundreds of books, and he's written books in every, every category of the Dewey Decimal System in the, in the library. He's, he's crazy good. And... He's considered by many people to be the greatest science fiction writer of all time. And what he wrote everything, he didn't use a computer because that was 84. He didn't use computers back then. And even when people started to, he's like, oh, that's bullshit. He used an actual manual. He didn't use an electric typewriter. He used a manual typewriter. Those of you who don't know what that is, that's where it's not electronic. You have to like press hard with the keys and it goes, tick, tick. I used to have one. Later, you know, by 84, 85, people convert to electri electric typewriters. So you would just type the keys and it would electrically pound the, 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 the paper. So you went to press as hard. He used a manual typewriter. He typed everything himself. He actually answered letters and he answered every letter himself. And he actually typed this letter to me and he signed it. And even when I was a 12-year-old kid, I knew Isaac Asimov. I had already read um, <clears throat> the Foundation Trilogy, which is one of the best you know, one of the best found, foundation is one of the bases for like uh, Star Wars. So is Dune, um, one of the greatest trilogies ever written. The whole series. There's also iRobot, a bunch of other stuff. Matter of fact, over here, um, I'll grab it. Hang on a sec. Right up my bookshelf here. So I'll tell you really quick about Isaac Asimov. He wrote a bunch of uh, science fiction novels, and one of the critiques that he got from the critics was, "There's no sex." And there's no aliens in any of your books, Isaac Asimov. And the reason is the milieu he used to write in, he leaned into the Fermi paradox. The Fermi paradox is where's all the aliens, right? Now, if this is simulation theory, which I'm 80%, 70% believing in, there are no aliens. This is all background shit that we're seeing. But he leaned into that. He said, okay, yeah, there are no aliens. Human beings are the only form of life, intelligent life in the entire Milky Way galaxy. So he wrote about if human, if human beings colonize the entire Milky Way, that was his thing, right? So there were never any aliens. And for some reason, he didn't write about sex. He didn't write about sex or romance or that stuff. He would hint at it, but he never write. So then, finally, in, let's see, 60s or 70s? I forget when he did this. He wrote this book, Gods Themselves. This is a, this is a, this is actual gold. This is real gold. I bought, I have a whole set of these. Um, limited edition, 
Does this, did he sign this one? Hang on a sec. Let me see here. Uh, so is that a suture? Not this one. Okay. This actually, this book actually is worth money. So this is the gods themselves. He wrote a book called the gods themselves. It's about aliens fucking. He's like, all right, fine. I'll write a book with aliens having sex. This is one of the best science fi books I've ever read in my entire life. You should read this thing. It's amazing. I should talk about this over my other channel. He gets, he, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. I can do a whole thing on this book. And this is just something he just whipped out of his ass. Just said, all right, fine. I'll write a book that, about aliens that has sex in it. And, it was, and it's amazing. It became critically acclaimed. And he's extraordinary. So anyway. Um, I open the envelope, pull out this letter. I read this letter. This letter is right here. This is one of my prized possessions. I framed it. This is how small it was. I still have this. I have been all over the world. I've lived all over the world. I've, I've moved. You can guess the number of times I've moved in my life since I was 12. I'm 51 years old. This has always come with me. It's one of the few possessions that comes with me that I never throw away. That always comes with you anywhere in the world I go. This is it. This is one of my prized possessions. I will not be able to replace this in a fire or anything like this. This is priceless. I would never sell it. This is the letter. There is his. That's the letter right there. There is his autograph. You can see the date. January 9. So it says 9 January 1985. See that? I don't know if you can see that. That's it. I'll read it to you real quick. It's really cute. Isaac Asimov. This is his little. That's his letterhead. He's fucking Isaac Asimov. Okay. Dear Caleb, he knew he was speaking to a child, so he kept it pretty simple. If you want to be a science fiction writer, you should read a lot of science fiction. And you should keep trying to write. Also, it would be very helpful if you know science. <laughs> so when you can, take science classes in school and read books on science too. And then Isaac Asimov. So there you go. So this changed my whole opinion about writing and wanting to be a writer and taking writing seriously as a, as a career, as a calling. One of the reasons that as an adult, I was able to make multi six figure income just from writing. Now here's the thing. What percentage of fiction writers make any money? writing. It's a fraction of fraction of 1%. It's easier to make money nonfiction, which is what I ended up doing. <clears throat> but one of the reasons that I ended up by the time I was, let's see, late thirties, first I was a consultant for uh, most of that time. But when I rolled into writing and I was able to make six figure income from writing, doing the thing that I wanted to do my whole life, making a six multi six figure income at doing that, I make a lot more money now, but getting to that point, one of the reasons for that there's several reasons. One of the reasons is this. And so, so I sat there in 1980 on January. So he wrote this January 9th, 1985. So by the time I got it, it was late Jan. So late January, 1985, I'm sitting there with this little tiny letter on my little desk. And all these kids are like, what? They're throwing this stuff around. How many of those kids and I don't know the statistics on this. I could find this out because I know a lot of those kids still, at least on Facebook and stuff, those kids who are now in their 50s. How many of those kids, A, did, grew up to do the thing they wanted to be? What percentage of that classroom? Probably pretty low. Secondly, of that percentage of kids who grew up to do what they wanted to do, what percentage of those kids made a really made a living out of it, did it well enough to make to be successful at it, not just make 40000 a year and pay the electric bill? I don't know. It is entirely possible that I'm the only kid. In, I'm the only kid in that room. It was a small classroom. This is a Catholic school. It's not like a public school. There's like 35 kids in a class. There was about, uh, I don't know, 23 kids in that room. Probably less. 20? That's it. Don't know. So sometimes, a few things on this. Number one, the littlest thing can make the biggest difference. This is not the first time. Oh, this wouldn't be the last time that Someone made a very small gesture that would look small, but to me it was like, oh my fucking God. Number one. Number two, I 
remember this. And I remember the effect it had on me. And so when I do, um, what I experienced in, um, when I started doing seminars around the world, and I really ramped this up hardcore up to 2018, I backed off in 2019, then we had the pandemic. So at the height, the height of me doing seminars around the world was 2018-ish. I did a world tour where I spoke in like 22 different cities around the world, something like that. Um, when I started speaking around the world, <clears throat> I would have men come up to me, usually young men, men in their 20s, after I would do a seminar or a speech or whatever, or a, a, a workshop or whatever. They would come to me. I had, and, and at one point I had, it was 2017 or 18, I forget when this was. I had almost three times in a row, different cities, three different men who came up to me who didn't know each other in different cities, different parts of the world. And they would come up to me and they would say some variation of, you are the closest thing I've ever had to a dad. And when I heard that, I remembered this. And I started taking this material, Sovereign CEO and my other stuff too, very, very seriously. Because I understand because of what this helped me do in my life, this little tiny thing. How long did it take Isaac Aslan to type this thing? He probably typed very fast. So a few seconds. I mean, this was in and out of his life in a few seconds. And he didn't have to do this. He's Isaac Asimov. He didn't have to fucking do this. Ah, so this little thing made such a big difference. And so now I understand, and, and this applies to many of you. When you are a content creator, when you are a coach or a consultant, or you're offering some sort of service, or you're writing, and even if you have, some of you have, medium-sized audiences, some of you have small audiences, some of you are just getting started. There's a handful of you that have bigger audiences. You have to take seriously the impact that you make on people. I've had people tell me that I'm rewriting, I'm updating the book right now, The Unchained Man. I've had men tell me that they bought a gun, they loaded the bullets to kill themselves, they read my book, and it prevented them from killing themselves and now they make money, they're location dependent. I've had, I've had these emails. When, you doing, when you're doing anything in the public like this, you don't realize how much of an effect you have on people. And I will never realize the effect I have on people because and I can't compare myself to Isaac Asimov. I'm, I'm, I will never be anywhere near that famous. I don't want to be famous. I've said this 10,000 times. I don't want to be famous. The effect that this few seconds he did on that kid in 1985 to me, I mean, it's one of the pivotal moments of my life, probably. I don't know. I don't know if I would have been as prolific a writer or spent the time and effort to write had this not happened. So one of the things I've talked about many times is that when I started my blog, I talked about this when you're starting, when you start your own blog, right? My blog, my original blog way back in 2009, I wrote three blog articles per week for a year and a half before any real money started coming in. Now, to be fair, some money did come in immediately. It was a little hunk because I was already well-known on certain forums and things like that under the name Black Dragon. But the real money, the reliable money that I could use, like pay bills, that didn't happen for, I don't know the exact number of months, uh, more than a year. So that means I had to write a fucking article, three articles a week, for a, yeah, three articles a week for over a year. And I never took a week off ever. That was a big thing about my blog. Unlike most bloggers in that space and most bloggers in any space, you'd have guys who would just stop blogging for four weeks because they get a girlfriend or something or they get busy with work and then they come back a few months later and start up again. I never took a break. Every three weeks, excuse me, three blog posts a week, every week without fail. Later, I reduced it down to two, but it was every fucking week. Doesn't matter if I was sick. Doesn't matter if it was Christmas. Doesn't matter if I was traveling. Doesn't matter what was going on in my personal life, my work life, how busy I got, how bad things got, how good things got. I hit that hard every week. And I don't know if I had would have done that had this not been in my subconscious. Maybe I would have. Maybe not. I don't think so. I don't know. So that's the difference that many of you can make even if you think your audience isn't that big. Did I have a huge audience back when I started my blog? I didn't know. No one was paying attention. A few people. That's it. It turned into something later. But I still don't have a giant audience. 
I don't want a Johnny Knight. I've said this 10,000 times. I want to be as least famous as possible, hit the objectives I want. I don't want to, I hate being well known. And if there was another way to do it, I would. <laughs> I have other companies. So be aware of this. Any of you who are doing any sort of content creation business, you need to remember to take it seriously because you don't realize the effect you're going to have on people. And it doesn't matter what you're teaching either. Well, Caleb, I'm an accountant. I teach accounting skills. You don't realize what your information helps, how your information helps other people. If people, you know, don't kill themselves because of you. If people start a company and make, okay, let me give you two, two quick examples of, of just some people I've talked to in the last few weeks. I just talked to a guy. He might be watching this video. If he knows, if you know who you are, if you if you're watching this, someone in my audience who came to one of my first Black Dragon uh, seminars I did in in 2012 in Las Vegas. I'm not going to say who. I'm not going to give you hints about you know. He's not even white. He's. He, I'll just say he's not white. Young guy. Okay. Eager. Talked to him a few weeks ago. Talked to him three weeks ago. Just sold his business. For $9 million. $9 million. He's in his early 40s. Now, he had a partner. He has to split that with his partner, 50-50. He used a broker, so he doesn't get all that money. But whatever, $9 million, 50% of that, when he's 41, 42, not bad. There's another guy, and this is someone, if I said his name, some of you know this is. Someone else in my audience got started with my material a few years ago. He's doing $200,000 a month right now, online income. You don't realize the change you're going to make in people's lives. I'm not, and I'm not here to brag. I'm here to tell you what this did for me and what you can do for other people. I don't usually talk about this aspect of these things. You don't, you don't know. And now here's the thing. Your biggest success stories, your biggest success stories are probably people that you're, that you're never going to find out about. I, most likely, especially with my dating material, my biggest success stories are things I'm never going to hear about from my audience. No one's going to write me an email. The biggest people, hey, Caleb, I started out like this, and now I have this and this and this and this and this. I really want to thank you. I get those emails, but the biggest success stories I'm probably never going to hear about. You don't realize the impact you make, the positive impact. And there's so much negativity on the internet, we forget about this. And you're so caught up in your own life, you forget about this too. This year has been a more difficult year for me than most years, which is, you know, not saying much because I have great years. But I've had moments this year, I'm like, fuck, man. God damn it. All these problems piled one after the next. And, and part of what pushed me through those moments was knowing, hey, there are people who you haven't helped yet, who you've already helped. A, there's people already helped who want, to continue, who want your continued presence. And B, there are people you haven't helped yet. So if you just stop doing this shit, how, how does that work? Right? You're just going to let those people have those problems? Is that what you want to do? This goes back to having a mission. Part of my mission is helping you guys and gals. This is Harvard CEO, so gals can do this too. That's my mission. It's part of why I exist and why I work. Not just to make money. Making money is very important, especially the next two and a half years until I turn 54. After I turn 54, different story. But money is pretty critical. It's very important. I've talked about this a billion times. So just be aware of this. Because and and maybe some of you have your own stories from other people, not me, but other people that a mentor or someone who you know you met or someone famous or relatively famous who sent you an email. I mean, I can talk about like Harry Brown, those you know he is. We had an email correspondence before he died. I still have his emails. I'm gonna keep them forever. That that kind of thing. I was able to meet Brian Tracy and work with him for a, a, actually a few years. My big mentor of mine. I mean, these are things I'll always remember. So that's it. Let me take a drink. Hang on. No, this is not vodka. Rob, Bob, you're being very nice. I won't bring up your comment, but thank you very much. You're very nice about that. And yes, I'm bummed about UMS. But here's the thing about UMS and Founder Sanctum. There is something coming shortly to replace those programs. It's going to be a little different than what you expect. Can't talk about it, but something's coming. Don't worry. There's always a void. The void will always be filled with something. Don't worry. Um, really fast. Before we go to the next topic. 
Um, um, hang on. Where are my, where are my banners? You can, I've talked about this briefly before. Where's my comments? Here we go. You can now get residency in the countries of Dubai, which is the United Arab Emirates. We have some people in Dubai right now doing this. Uh, Paraguay. We just signed up another person, I think, for Paraguay. Mexico and Armenia. And you can now go whenever you want. We've reduced the price. It's cheaper now. And you can make payments for up to 12 months, depending on various factors. You don't have to pay the entire thing up front. So you start making the payments and we start working on your residency. You don't have to make, it's not like you make 12 months of payments and then we start working on your residency. We are the only company on the entire internet, Sovereign CEO, where you can do this. There's no other com company that I know of. Find one if you can, where you can get legal residency in a country, a mainstream country like Mexico, Paraguay. Paraguay is probably not mainstream. Mexico, Paraguay, Armenia, Dubai, and you can make payments. There is no other company, there's no other attorney firm that I know of where you can make payments. You can do this now. You can also do a slightly more advanced version or a more expensive version where Billy and or I are actually there with a group doing this at the same time. You can do that as well and make it more of an event. Otherwise, you can go whenever you want. And it's cheaper. So now you're not logged into our schedule anymore and you can make payments. Cool? www.caleb.pop slash go. I kept it very simple. You have to type www. I'm sorry. I wish you didn't. A few of you had questions about Hey, what are the um what are the fees to renew like to renew your Dubai residency to renew your Paraguay? How often do you have to go back? What I probably will do next week is I'll go through each country really quick and say once you have residency, this is how long it lasts. This is how often you have to go back. This is how you have to renew it. Can you renew it remotely? And what's involved in renewing it? Things like that. Um, I will probably cover that next week in next week's live stream because I get a lot of questions about this. Um, it's valuable to know anyway if you can do this on your own to know how long these residencies last things like that, how much it costs. Some of these places, it's very cheap. Some of these places, Dubai, it's kind of expensive. But Dubai, you'd only do that if you're saving money on taxes. Whole big thing. Um, I will also talk about next week, I will also discuss the 9% corporate tax. Getting questions about this. It's a little messy and convoluted because Dubai's never had a tax before. They had to do it because all these countries, the Western, the collapsing Western world was going to blacklist UAE and they didn't want to do it. And, so anyway, um, it's here's the bottom line. If you're an American, it doesn't matter. It's not relevant. <laughs> it might be relevant if you're a Canadian or European, maybe, maybe. But even if you have to pay that full tax, and it's only up to a certain point. It's only past a certain income level. I'll discuss all that maybe next week. It's not a big deal. Um, what else do I want to say about that? I don't want to say anything else about that www.caleb.top slash go. That brings you to a main page with all four countries. And we have guys, we have several guys and gals. Billy just talked to someone who is a whole family going to do Paraguay. We have, we have families doing this in Paraguay now. We have husband, wife, and like two or three kids. We've had several of them. Pretty cool. Yes, you get discounts if you bring your spouse or bring your kids. Yes, you get discounts for all that stuff. Yes, 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 yes. Um, okay. Well, it's not talk. Do we have any questions real quick? Let me, let me check questions. I'll go to the next topic. Hang on a sec. Hey, Caleb, I was running of a place that looks as nice as Switzerland, but not part of the Western world. Um, Let's see. Dude, a lot of South America is fucking beautiful. Paraguay, some of Paraguay. Some of Paraguay is kind of bland. A lot of Paraguay is fucking beautiful. A lot of Argentina is beautiful. You don't get the snow. You want snow? Snow is more complicated. But if you just want that kind of, those that that beauty, oh, yeah. A lot of those places. Interesting about Switzerland. I, I was talking to the guys who are here in Dubai. We did the, the seminar on Mastermind this weekend. Next, not this Christmas, but next Christmas of 2024, which is going to be the best year of my life. I'm going to cap off that year. I'm going to do an entire Christmas in Switzerland. So, so Europe collapsing suicidal Europe is not somewhere I would live, but it's okay to visit there and then get the fuck out. So you use it. You use Europe and then leave. Kind of like California. You don't live in California. You go to California, use it, and then you leave. You don't stay there. So I'm going to do it either Switzerland or Austria. I haven't decided which one. Probably Switzerland. Austria's got some cool Christmas shit to have like a snowy Christmas. Because when you have Christmas in Dubai, it feels weird. You're on the beach and it's like 80 degrees and sunny. And it just, it's fun, 
And I, I'm, I have a nice view here, and people have their Christmas lights out. It's kind of cute, but it's just it's different. <clears throat> what do I think of passport bros? I have no strong opinion. Anyone who helps getting people out of the collapsing West is good for me. Great. Thoughts on Europe's EID proposal. I never give a shit about any proposals or rumors or things you've heard. I only care about things that actually happen. I've talked about this many times. Caleb, they're talking about doing this, and then they never do it, so I don't care. When they actually pass it, and they're actually implementing it and enforcing it, then I'll have an opinion on it. Because the vast majority of these times, these are the kind of things, nothing, nothing happens. So yeah, that's the way it works. Great asthma story about the gods themselves on Kindle. Sounds like a fun book. Thanks for recommendation. I will do, I am tempted to do a whole, on my other channel, a whole analysis really quick. There are humans in it, but there are also aliens. But there are three sexes. Instead of male, female, um, the aliens have three sexes. There is um, rationals, emotionals, and parentals. And it's hilarious. It's fascinating. The way he, he gives us so much thought. So rationals, the close parallel would be men, kind of. Emotionals, the close parallel would be women, sort of. And parentals, the closest parallel we could give it would be like an effeminate gay man. So the rationals fall in love with the emotionals and then the parentals, they all fall in love with each other and they all do it. And then they have babies and then the parentals take care of the babies and the rationals go to work and the emotionals just kind of hang around and talk to their friends. It's, so, it's hilarious. It's fantastic. It's a great, great book. <clears throat> uh, let's see. There are some countries from Eastern Europe that may join the EU even though it's collapsing. Of course. Of course there will, unfortunately. It's too bad. Um, okay. Let me go to the next topic. Do, 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 hang on. Okay. This is big. If you have more questions, go ahead and ask them, and I'll rewind the questions in the chat. Cool? Felix, you're right. We've got a lot of people online, don't we? Holy shit. That means one of my email guys just sent a thing to my list saying, hey, I'm live. Because before, one of these live streams, I'm like, wow, there are a lot of people. And I didn't even announce this. But I didn't realize one of my marketing guys sent an email to my list saying, hey, I'm live right now. Go, go log in. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's why. I thought it was organic. <laughs> uh, all right, hang on. Where's my, where's my topic? I got so many topics. This is what happens when you're a prolific writer. You have too many topics. Hang on. I talked about that already. I talked about that already. Um, okay, I talked about that. That was last week. I need to be, I have a, now that I'm doing live streams, I don't have a system, an actual system down of, of managing these topics when I do these live streams. I gotta, I gotta clean the system a little bit. Okay, that's not that's not for this channel. That's the other channel. Okay, here we go. Awesome. All right. This goes back to assessing threats. And I'm piggybacking, I am piggybacking this off those of you who are so worried about what's going on in Israel right now. Oh my God, Caleb, what do you think about living in Dubai? Even though they've been they've been killing each other there since 1960s. And they will for the next hundred years. Why are you guys concerned about this? But anyway, hang on. But Caleb, what about this? What about EID, Caleb? Oh no. I'm gonna give you a step-by-step -step process on how you assess a threat. Now, I've already talked about the 2% rule. If you don't know what the 2% rule is, let me review it very briefly. I'm not gonna talk about this. That's not the topic. It's related to the 2% rule. 2% rule is this. I have an entire YouTube video on this and on articles about this. Go read the articles, go watch the video if you want more details. And I address all the objections and all the bullshit. But what about this? The 2% rule is this. If something has less than a 2% chance of occurring, you ignore it and proceed as if it's not going to happen, regardless of how bad the consequences are. Caleb, what if I walk outside my house and a meteor comes out of the sky and hits me in the head? Why are you worried about this? What are the statistical probabilities of this happening? Okay. Oh, uh, fraction one percent. Then you ignore it and you proceed. You don't worry about it. Okay. It's very simple. I talked a lot about this when COVID hit, and all of you guys, not you guys. Well, many of you guys, oh, no, COVID, oh, my God. 
billions of people are going to die and their body bags stacked up and you'll see body bags from space and we'll have martial law and oh fuck right all you left-wingy guys like ah and then all you trump idiots you can't make me wear a mask i'll have to breathe my own carbon dioxide oh shit if i get the vaccine bill gates will put robots in my body and then i'll get ed and my dick won't work ah! all wrong because you don't know how to assess threats you react emotionally instead of rationally so that's the 2% rule. Let me give you another technique I've used most of my life. I've used this technique longer than the 2% rule to assess threats. It's a very, very simple question. There's two questions. When someone says, but what about this, Caleb? Or someone tries to warn me about something, Caleb, you need to be concerned about this. Caleb, did you know that whatever the fuck it is, whatever bullshit thing, okay? <clears throat> is it real? Is it relevant? So first you ask yourself, is it real? And I'll go through several specific examples. Is it factually accurate? You know what? The COVID vaccine is going to kill you. It's going to give you a heart attack. Is it real? Is there actual real verifiable data that proves this or not? If it is, then you go to the second question. If it isn't real, if it's not a factual thing, and most of the time it's not factual at all, it's just people being scared. If it's not real then you don't worry about it because it's not real. It sounds scary. It's an emotional thing that people get worked up about, like Palestine and India and Israel. Yeah, oh, sometimes it's a good thing. Caleb, in 2016, Caleb, Trump's going to build a wall. Awesome. Is it real? What did I say in 2016? No, he's not, you idiots. I said, no, he's not. Is he actually going to build a wall? No, so it's not real. You can assess this based on threats and, and, and non non-threats, positive, potentially positive things. Caleb, you might win the lottery if you do this. Okay, Is it real? If the answer is yes, it is real. It is true. You have the second question. Is it relevant to me? Not to the person asking the question, not to someone living in some other country, not to someone who, let's do a COVID thing, someone who is 82 years old and, and has cancer and is fat. Not that person. Me. Is it relevant to me? If the answer is no, it's it's real, but it's not relevant to me, I don't worry about it, I proceed. Now, <clears throat> if the answer is yes, it's real, and yes, it's relevant, now I have to pay attention to it. Now I have to factor it in there within the 2% rule. Now, let me, let me talk about relevance for a second. Is it relevant within the 2% rule? Does it have a higher of 2% chance of occurring? Will I ever get into a car accident at any point throughout my entire life? What are the statistical probabilities that I will do this? Is it more than 2%? Yes, yeah, way more than 2%. Way more. So guess what I do when I get in a car? I put on my seatbelt. In my other channel, I talk about if you marry a woman, legally marry a woman, what is the statistical probability you, not your great-grandpa from the 1920s, not some guy who lives in Taiwan or India. You, what is the statistical problem that you will ever get divorced? Is it more than 2%? <laughs> so you sign an enforceable, enforceable, enforceable prenuptial agreement. Not because you're an asshole, but because you're saying, is it real? Is it relevant? What is the statistical probability? Okay, I'll give you specific examples how I do this. All right? Okay. <clears throat> um, let's see here. <clears throat> Several examples. Already, oh, so on my list of examples, Trump's going to build a wall. So when so many of you said, Trump's going to build a wall, Caleb, in 2016, 2017, I said, no, he's not. Now, why did I say no, he's not? Did I just knee-jerk say, no, he's not? No, I, I'm not a left-winger. I've never voted a Democrat my entire life and I never will. The left is insane. No, the right's also insane, unfortunately, now. So I said, okay, how would Trump is how would Trump as or any president in the late 2000 teens actually build a wall, a physical wall, a physical actual barrier that someone couldn't just punch through or knock down, a real wall, not a chain link fence, a real wall from San Diego to Brownsville, Texas. Do you know what the train is like? Do you know how long that is? How much that would cost? How would someone get through that? Through Congress, how would the construction project, how would it be paid for? I said, that's not going to happen. And I was right. Is it real? No, it's not real. Now, let's say it was real. And that's why I say, oh, yeah, he really could build a wall. That, he could build a wall. Is it relevant to me? 
would it be relevant to me for Trump to build a wall in the United States? No, because I'm leaving the collapsing United States, so it's not even relevant. So just totally, but it wasn't real, so I even go there. Make sense? I looked at this objectively and rationally, not emotionally. Most guys or many people who said he's going to build a wall weren't evaluating anything rationally and objectively. You were just getting excited. And when you get excited, the problem to get excited is your higher brain function shut down. I've talked about this. Your brain was formed from the back to the front. So your reptilian shit is back here. Your logic centers are up here. When you get really fucking mad or really fucking excited, this shit shuts down. And you can't make rational decisions anymore. You can't make rational processes anymore. I don't have that problem. I take a deep breath and I calm down and I start thinking and I examine. And I live a really good life because I have that ability. Most Americans, most Westerners don't have that ability, both on the left and the right, unfortunately. Look what happened with COVID. Okay. <clears throat> uh, next example. Oh, yeah. So in the early 2000s, Al Gore came out with a movie and said, oh, my God, the polar ice caps are going to melt in 10 years. See, I'm not just attacking the right. I'm attacking the left, too, because you're all insane. Holy shit, everybody. In 10 years, by 2011, I think was the year, the polar ice caps are going to melt. And all these left workers said, oh, my God, Caleb, the polar ice caps are going to melt. And it's going to raise the sea levels. They're going to be flooding. And, and all these weather problems. Oh, my, it's going to be terrible. Because there's going to be no polar ice caps at all. I said, no, it's not. Now, did I just say, no, it's not? No, I looked at the data. I've talked about this before. Environmental hysteric people have been talking about <laughs> catastrophes every 10 years since the 70s. I've mentioned this before. I'll do it again. In the 19, And I was alive in the 70s. I remember all this stuff. In the 1970s, the environmental left said, oh, my God. In, in the next 10 years, we're all going to die because there were two different things. A, we're going to run out of food. Pe that was a big concern. This, that the world will run out of food or we're all going to die of an ice age. Ice will cover the earth and we're all going to die. They said this in the 70s. They were serious. Then it was the, did it happen? No. 10 years, we're all fine. Then in the 80s, oh my God, we're all going to die in 10 years because there's a hole in the ozone layer. I grew, I grew up in the 80s. This was a big, oh, my God, there's a hole the size of Texas, the ozone, where all these gases are going to come in. We're all going to get radiated to hell. We're all going to die in 10 years. In 10 years, we were fine. Then in the 90s, oh, shit, Al Gore comes along and the polar ice caps are going to melt. Oh, we're all fucked. Er, and then, of course, that's that. Every 10 years, we're gonna, the world's going to end. They say that now. Oh, in 10 years, we're all fucked. because. So these people have a long track record of being consistently wrong. I knew that Al Gore would be wrong about this. I said, no, it's not. It's not real. Okay. Now let's say it was real. You could make, is it relevant? You could live inland. <laughs> I mean, right. <laughs> For example, but again, it wasn't real. Um, Israel and Palestine are at it again. Oh my God, Caleb, Caleb. The Israelis and Palestinians are killing each other. Aren't you concerned? Okay. What did I say last time about this or two weeks ago on this? You can go watch the video. I did a whole analysis on this. Israel and Palestine have been killing each other since the 1960s. Did, was there a nuclear war in the 1960s? Was there a huge World War III because of the 1960s? How about the 1970s when they were doing it? How about the 1980s when they were doing it? How about the 1990s when they were doing it? How about the 2000s when they were doing it? How about the 2000s when they were doing it? In the 2000s, will they suddenly do it? No. So is it real? Are they actually killing each other? Yes. Really bad shit is happening because it always happens over there. Here's, here's my, I, I gave my detailed analogy. I'll give you a different analogy and I'll move on. I want to talk about this. Israel, so you have Hamas. Hamas is, is a, if you look at it, as, if you visualize Hamas as a person, Hamas is a murderous serial, psycho serial killer with a big knife and he kills people. Oh, yeah, he's evil, okay? The government of Israel, not Israel, not people, the government, the government of Israel is not evil, but he's this big, hulking, furious, alpha male 1.0 who's like sitting here like this, like, man, you better not fucking touch me, man. He's that guy in uh, Stripes. Remember Francis in Stripes? Any one of you fuckers call me Francis, I'll kill you. You touch me, I'll kill you. And so that's Israel's government. Man, you fucking touch me, I will fucking end you. I will fucking kill you, motherfucker. And if someone comes over and pokes Israel, pokes him in the side, he's like, Rah! he grabs his head and he twists it on, he bashes his head in the fucking throat, and then he sits back down. He's like, man, Who's next, mother? He doesn't go out and kill people, but he react, overreacts, right? Because he's a psycho. He's a touchy motherfucker. So you have 
These two guys sitting in the same room together because they have to be there because the religion say so. So what's the solution? There is none. So that's the deal. War in Ukraine. Caleb. Putin in Ukraine. NATO fucked Putin over, so he had to kill thousands of people, Caleb. All right. Is it real? Yes. I know Ukrainians here in Dubai. I know Russians here in Dubai. Yeah, I'm well aware of this. I have all kinds of detail about this. Oh, yeah, it's horrible. Yes. So is it real? Yes, it's real. There really is a war. Is it relevant to me living in Dubai? Is Putin going to launch nukes at Dubai? Is Israel going to launch nukes at Dubai? Can Palestine launch nukes at Dubai? Is it relevant to me? So both these things. Is it relevant to me here in Dubai? <laughs> well, Caleb, Iran, I did an entire video on Iran and does Iran threaten Dubai? I did an entire analysis with numbers and data and facts. Go watch over there. None of this is relevant to me living in Dubai. Probably not relevant to you unless you live in Israel. If you live in the United States, Australia, Europe, is it relevant? No. Now, is the war in Ukraine? Is that relevant to you? Now, is it relevant to me in Dubai? No. If you live in Europe, though, you're going to have a lot of problems. You're going to start having them now with, you know, electricity bills and heating oil and things like that because that war, uh-huh. So it might be relevant to you. If you live in Europe, get the fuck out of collapsing Europe. Okay, for example. So is it real? Is it relevant? Um, the UAE 9% corporate tax. So two years ago when they announced this, everyone said, oh, fuck, fuck Dubai now. I guess, Caleb, you're an idiot. You moved to Dubai. Now they have a tax. I said, no, they don't. What? Yeah, they don't. There was no tax two years ago. There was no tax a year ago. I said it's going to be in two years. It's going to be in 2023. It will not apply to free zone companies. It'll only apply to free zone companies that make a certain amount, send a certain company. It won't fucking matter. And it doesn't. Is it real? Now, in many cases, it wasn't real. It wasn't active two years ago. It was active two years down the road. They're all, they're all, I can't even, you know, I can't say certain things publicly because it's Dubai. But anyway, so all that stuff. Um, let's see. You know, stuff in your personal life, too. Caleb, this person said this about you, right? Or this person did this. So a lot of you have this in your personal life. People will say, oh, that, hey, this person's doing this. This person said, if this happens in this, is it real? Did that person really say that? Often they didn't. Just went through a scenario this morning in my business life where someone said, well, this person said this. And because they said this, we had this huge fucking problem. I said, I didn't say this. I thought I said, that does not sound like something that person would say. Conferred with that person. Person said, yes, I did say that, but I also said this and this and this. I went, oh, of course. So is it real? Find out if it's real. Don't just say, oh, no. Is it real? Then if it is real, is it relevant to you or the scenario? Things that may not be relevant to you might be very relevant to other people. So some people, if you live in Israel and you're like, oh, my God, this is terrible, probably relevant to them. When COVID first hit, there were a few people on blogs who said, Caleb, you don't understand. This is horrible. I work in a hospital. And I work in a hospital in New York with all these old people and all these ventilators. And it's, it's, like, it's, devil, it's like hell here. This is going to cover the whole world. So it was relevant to them working in that little hospital. Was it relevant to me or the world? No. In terms of, again, the pandemic was a worldwide overreaction to a flu with a 1% death rate, if that. Okay, and I was right. Everything I said, I made seven, about 17 predictions about COVID. I was wrong on one of them. I self-corrected on that one. I self-corrected within a week. Because, is it real? Is it relevant? Those are two questions you ask yourself. Um, that's it. We've got questions here. Oh, shit, we got a lot. Beep, 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 beep. Um, favorite classic novel. You know, I'm not big on super... Well, I do have a favorite classic novel. Uh, Count of Monte Cristo. By far, that's it. I was about to. I'm not super to classic novels, but Count of Monte Cristo. Boom. There you go. <clears throat> what do you think of Cody Sanchez buying boring businesses? It's not location dependent, but she takes advantage of buying businesses built by previous boomer generations. It is a fantastic thing. It is not anything having to do with any business model I teach. It's not location dependent. It is the opposite of what I teach. If you love her stuff, go do her stuff, but you will not be as free as if you follow my stuff. But nothing wrong with it. It's great. You mentioned the philosophy of the point adds seven to eight years of healthy life. Could you spend a little bit on that? Yes, uh, really quick, because you have inflammation on your gums that you don't see. The inflammation directly goes into your bloodstream that goes right up to your brain. 
and affects your brain and your bloodstream at a deep level. All that garbage in your gums, it doesn't just sit in your gums. It goes actually into your bloodstream, through the bottom of your tongue and through the gum, into your blood, and it gets pumped right to your brain. So if you have a bunch of dirty fucking gums, now here's the problem. This is one of the examples one of the dentists talked to me about when I, one of these experts. If you had the same amount of average inflammation the average person who doesn't floss has on the ends of their fingers or the ends of their toes, it would look disgusting. It'd be pus and it'd be gross. And you'd be like, oh my God, and you'd take care of it because you see it. But because you don't see the inflammation up in your gums, it's just as bad. And it's just as harmful, just you don't see it. So that's why. Make sure you read from the correct topic. Yes. I know. Bad me. I think it was pretty funny, actually. <clears throat> you said you plan to live at 125 years old. How's living that long even possible? Because by the time you, I get to age 80, I'm 50, 51. By the time I get to age 80, that's 30 years in the future. There will be multiple medical advancements between now and 30 years. That's why. Adding in everything I do, water, all the anti-aging stuff, that's how you do it. It's not just things you do. It's also medical advances are going to happen over the next several decades. Yes, even as the Western world collapses. Now, some of these things will be expensive. You better make a lot of money. Yeah. <clears throat> what is the statistical probability of Putin invading another country? Right now, I don't know. Um, decent. At least 15%. At least 15, maybe 20. You can do it. Hell yeah. But Israel is about Jews, so the media tells me it's relevant. It's relevant for the media. So all this, oh my God, guys, be scared. That makes money for the media. So it's relevant to the media. Is it relevant to you? No. 125 is going to be tough. No, it will not. 125 will not be tough at all. It will not be difficult at all. With all the things I'm doing now to extend my life, to get well past average life expectancy of 79 by the time I'm 79, it'll be 30 years in the future. All the medical advances between now and then that I will take advantage of because I can afford it, it won't be a big deal at all. How do you deal with people when people get offended that you don't want to participate in worrying? I'm outcome independent, so I just remove myself. I don't care what other people think. I, I don't, I'm not going to involve myself in that stuff. How should a mission, musician go about making money? You do not want to do anything in terms of music. You want to do something in terms of the musician or musical niche. Can you be a producer for other musicians? Can you be an editor for the musicians? Can you get deals for the musicians? Sell to, sell to people in the music industry. Don't try to sell your music. That will not work. Caleb, in terms of tax and divide, aren't you worried about possible retroactive law? This is a great example. What are the statistical probability Dubai is going to say? You owe us a billion dollars from money you made five years ago. No, Dubai doesn't want to piss people off. They want Dubai wants more people moving here and more money, not less. The only reason they're implementing the 9% tax is because the Western world is forcing them to do it. They didn't want to do it. Also, for now, it doesn't apply to Dubai, but certain businesses, what are the chances of it changing the future? All business, all companies, excuse me, all countries over time will raise their taxes. I've talked about this in my original Dubai video on when I moved to Dubai and I deal with all the objections. But Caleb, they might raise their taxes. Okay, if you live in the United States and you pay 40% tax and it gets higher, or you live in Dubai, you pay 0% tax and it gets a little higher. Which one would you rather be? It's a silly excuse. It's just silly. First question, is it real? What should we do if we can't decide the truth? I mean, I like to do it I, I mean, like what to do? We don't even know whether it's real or not. Well, sometimes we don't have enough info. Very rare. If you don't have the info, it's probably not relevant too. Give me a, a scenario where you cannot find the info and it's very likely to be relevant. If you just can't find the fucking any information at all, odds are it's not relevant. That's how it works. But give me an example, challenge me. Caleb, what do you think about eating carbs? Carbs like bread, you said, are causing inflammation. Cause are, yes, correct. I do not eat carbs except for fruit. Correct. I, I, my diet is keto plus fruit. I do not have bread. Unless I cheat. And sometimes I do. How many residues do you recommend having and how many do you have? I have five. 
I'm thinking of building both Dubai and Mexico, would it make sense? Depends on your objectives. So for my objectives, five makes sense. For many people, five is massive overkill. Depends on what your objectives are. If you're going to spend 50% of your time in Mexico or half the time in Dubai or most of your Dubai and then spend a great model, you live in Dubai and you spend summers in Guadalajara. Awesome. Year-round perfect fucking weather. That's what you should do. Do you want to do something like that? Yes, get residency. Just be aware of Mexico's 183-day rule about taxes. Yeah. If you want to live in Mexico but have Dubai as a backup or run your corporation through Dubai and pay a lot less tax, sometimes zero taxes, do that. Depends what you want. Depends what your plan is. Um, I think you should have at least two residencies. There's one and then a backup. My goodness, we have a lot of people in this live stream. Wow, holy shit. I'm getting famous. <laughs> He'll be your favorite philosophers or philosophers worth listening to. Marcus Aurelius, probably number one. I have a few. A few philosophers. That's a very big topic. We should talk about that over my other channel sometime. That's a big topic. What's your next major prediction for 2024? Um, the two final presidential candidates will be Donald Trump and Joe Biden again because you all have lost your goddamn minds and you're not even trying to solve any problems. That's my prediction for 2020. I don't know who will win. If it's Trump and Biden, it'll likely be Trump, but Biden could win. But I, it'll probably be Trump and Biden again because you right-wingers, who's the guy you're going to pick to save your country? You're going to pick a guy who's been impeached twice, arrested once, who thought Russia owned Norway, <laughs> who half the country think is Hitler. That's the guy you want. Okay, you're not even trying. You left-wingers, who's the guy you want? You want Biden. You want a guy who's so old, he could barely talk, literally could barely complete a sentence, who probably sexually assaulted somebody, who very obviously illegally funneled money to his son. The evidence is overwhelming. That's the guy you want running the bit. You, got, you guys aren't even trying to solve problems anymore. You're not even pretending. At least a few years ago, you were pretending to solve problems. Now America's like, ah, fuck it. So that's my prediction. Good luck, Americans. Get the fuck out. The other night I had issues in bed with a girl. No, no girl questions. <clears throat> no girl questions. Let's see. Um, how do you make the decision on how much money to spend on content creation and what was the catalyst for you to stop your heavily produced videos? Was committing for three years still money well spent? Um, no, it was not money well spent. I wasted money. Um, <clears throat> how much money to spend on content creation? What I said in that video, if your, if your organic social media or YouTube or video content is algorithm friendly, you should lean into it 100%. If you're going to start, one of the guys at the mastermind yesterday here in Dubai is going to start an AI, AI consulting business. He would kill it on YouTube. I said, man, you should do YouTube videos. AI, that is a great topic for YouTube. The YouTube algorithm loves AI. It, it jizzes over AI. Awesome. If you're going to start a business on how people can escape the collapse of the United States because the Western world is collapsing, you shouldn't do YouTube videos or barely do them. It's, it don't spend any money or any time. Yes, I do it because I have to. I have an existing audience. Or how to date multiple women at once. And these are not algorithm-friendly topics. So if you have an algorithm-unfriendly topic, and you're starting a business from scratch, I wouldn't focus on video. I would focus on some other format. So it depends on how algorithm-friendly in the collapsing left-wing authoritarian world in which we live, where big tech is left-wing because everything's left-wing now, how would that work? If you're going to talk, if you're gonna do a business on Batman, great. All these goddamn videos on the Marvels, the Marvels suck. Why did you go see the Marvels, you moron? <laughs> But it's algorithm friendly. Talk about Marvel movies, you'll kill it. I don't know what you'd sell. But the algorithm will love you. If you're dealt with resentment toward people, how do you fight it? You stop doing whatever you're doing that helps that helps uh, contribute to the resentment. Likely, if you resent someone right now, there's something you're doing. You're still spending time with that person, for example, to contribute to the resentments. So you stop doing that. You cut it off fast. If it was something that happened a long time ago, you need to fucking man up and get over it. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, why am I, why, why am I living? Why am I allowing that person to live rent free in my head? Why am I allowing that person to control my feelings? That's stupid. 
What is your opinion on RFK and Vivek Ramaswamy? Uh, my opinion is if you are concerned about either one of these two people, your life is out of control. I get comments all the time. Caleb, what do you think about Vivek? He's a libertarian, Caleb. He will not win. And if you're into these people, neither will RFK. And these people will not win. Is it real? Is Vivek real? Are, is RFK real? Are they running for office? Yes. Are they going to win? No. <laughs> no, they're not. So therefore, is it relevant other than entertainment? No. And in my view, politics should not be entertainment. Politics should be a methodology by which you solve problems or improve your society, solve societal problems. You guys miss that window by 20 years at least. Politics, you can't solve any problems now with politics. You're just, you're just jerking off at this point. <clears throat> First rule is keep an untroubled spirit. The second is to look things in the face and know them for what they are. Marcus Aurelius was a goddamn genius. I was just listening to his audiobook again. I mean, it's just ah, uh, fantastic. That's one of the few people I would like to sit down and talk to. Historical, just sit down and talk to Marcus Aurelius for like two hours. Oh my god, genius and an amazing person. Caleb, what? What? When you say we'll experience Western collapse, do you mean recession, hyperinflation, or currency devaluation? Go search on my Sovereign CEO YouTube channel. What will actually happen? There are six different scenarios. I go through all six. Let me check my schedule here. Are we doing on time? We're doing okay. All right, I'm gonna hang up for a little longer. Wait a second. <clears throat> By the way, I address that. I address hyperinflation, deflation. I address all those scenarios. War. Authoritarianism, I, I, there's about six different possible scenarios. <clears throat> when is a permanent residency necessary, if ever? It is never necessary. A permanent residency is never necessary. It's just a matter of convenience. 99% of the time, permanent residency means instead of renewing it every two years, you go, you got to renew it every five years. You still got to renew it. There are a few countries, Mexico is on the top of the list, where you get you can get real permanent residency. You never have to renew it. But that's rare. But is that required? Never. <clears throat> you are so wrong about Joe Biden and probably Trump as a candidate. If you are right this time, I'll be amazed. Who's who else is the who else the Democrats going to vote for? Who else? They're not going to vote for RFK. The elites won't allow that. Just like they didn't allow Bernie Sanders. So who else? Everyone hates um, Kamala. They hate her. Who else is going to be? It's not that they like Joe Biden. It's not the Democrats like to, they can't stand Joe Biden, but they hate, there's no one else and they can control Joe Biden. So likely it'll be Joe Biden. And, and the Americans go, okay, Joe Biden, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the term he uses five flags <clears throat> is five flag plan B for changes beyond our control or is the term five flags specific to business decisions? I don't understand your question. If you could rewrite your question, I'd be happy. I don't understand your question. In terms of assessing threat, threats, how do you figure out which sources to trust? I don't trust any sources. I look at multiple sources. So whenever I see a news story, especially one that I have to have an opinion about, I've talked about this, I will look at two left, one or two left-wing sources, one or two conservative Fox Newsy right-wingy sources, and if I can, a libertarian source like Reason, like Reason.com, and I will get an average of what they all say, and I'll probably get the truth there somehow. Also, I will look at non-American sources. You're going to get more accurate information, unfortunately, from places like uh, British news and like Al Jazeera, of all places, often than you will get American news. Remember Western clubs. I have some questions here that are more apropos to my other channel. I'm going to skip those. Yeah, I got a bone team. <laughs> what year, in your opinion, started the trend of people spending their free time hating things they hate rather than liking things they like? <clears throat> the 2000 teens, late 2000 teens, is when American cultural collapse really ramped up. The left took complete control over the narrative. You know, movies. TV, academia, all the colleges, all the mainstream news, all of big tech. I mean, everything. <laughs> and then the right wing said, oh, we're just crazy now. We're just going to start bitching and moaning. And 
are not doing anything other than bitching and moaning. <laughs> We're just going to bitch and moan about He-Man <laughs> and the Marvels. And we're going to vote for people like Trump who we know aren't going to, isn't going to do shit, but it sure is fun. That was the late 2000s. Some personal question. What is your greatest fear? How do you deal with it? Is it possible with someone who's always rational myself to not have fear at all? I don't think it's possible to have zero fear unless you're some kind of Buddhist monk who lives in cloistered, who lives in the, on the mountain in, in Tibet or something. Other than that, you're going to have fear. Uh, I only have one fear. I don't have any fears except one um, dying particularly dying of old age um, or, or, or not, excuse me, dying without any money, not dying of old age, dying and having no money. That's my only irrational thing and dying. I don't want to die. My life is really fucking good. So I don't want to die. It'll still be good when I'm old. Physically it won't be as good, but everything else will be good. So I don't want to die. It's not a fear, but it's like, oh, it sucks. There you go. Caleb, how stressed out do you think Europeans should be about the collapse? I don't think they should be stressed. I think they should leave. Bank collapse, not being able to exit the country. The most, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. It's like coming in one year or five years. I get that question all the time. I don't know when exactly Europe will collapse, and it won't all collapse at the same time because Europe is 45-plus countries. You can't generalize about this. If I knew exactly when the collapse was going to occur, I've said this many times, I would already be a billionaire. That's why you can never trust someone who says, you know what? Germany's going to collapse next year, next October. Or America's going to go down next year. They don't know. And if they knew, they'd already be billionaires. If you had that ability to predict the future that accurately, if I knew exactly when Europe would collapse, you know how much money I'd have already right now? If I had that level of skill, I don't. I don't know. The answer is soon slash in our lifetimes. When is America going to collapse? In your lifetime, which means it is real and it is relevant. Because it's going to happen in your lifetime. And the longer you fucking wait, the harder Five Flags gets. As I've been saying 10,000 times. Uh, some other questions that are really more apropos to my other channel. What superpowers are investing in Paraguay? Go watch the video about China in South America. China in South America. Korea, too. There is a huge, not huge, there is a statistically large Korean population in Asuncion, Paraguay. I was blown away when I first started going to Paraguay and this giant population of Koreans. What the fuck? Koreans in Asuncion? Yeah, Asia. While America is jerking off about the Middle East, Asia's taken over the world economically. Yep, it's great. You said it may be a good time to start a business in a field about which we have little knowledge. Yes. Is that true? Even if you like to start a consulting business. It's more complicated if you want to do a consulting business because you won't be able to do any of the consulting. So you're going to have to find a consultant or experts or technical experts, line them up, and then put together the deal. You could do this. Yes. I've known people who have had a consulting or consulting type practice, and they didn't do any consulting. Yeah, you can. <clears throat> book about consulting. That is not a question. Do I have a book about consulting? No. If you want a book about consulting, The Million Dollar Consultant by Alan Weiss. Asking for a friend. Yeah, right. I'm asking for not, I'm asking for a friend. So I'm asking for a friend, Caleb. My friend has a really tiny dick. It's a friend. So my friend with a really tiny dick. <laughs> if someone really wanted to, to sell their music or composing services, what would the best way to do it? I wouldn't do it. I would say, sorry, friend, don't do that. You won't make any money. The reason for this is if you sell anything artistic, <coughs> your probability is not based on skill. It is based on luck. And you cannot emulate luck. There's no system to be lucky. So if you're a comic book artist, if you paint, if you're a musician, any of that stuff, which is all, they're all wonderful things. I, I think you guys are amazing. I'm in awe of you guys. My daughter is an amazing artist. I'm in awe. But the odds of being successful, making a living doing those things, if you're a fiction writer, same thing. That's why I don't write fiction professionally. The odds of you being successful, making enough to pay, pay your bills is mostly based on luck, not based on skill. If you're a singer, I'm blown away by singers I know. They're better than any fucking singer that is famous. And they'll never make a lot of money because they don't know the right people. It's just luck. <clears throat> Do 
Join the 90 Day, 90 Day Biz Builder, and Billy has the most patience. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but if you join the 90 Day Biz Builder, you try to sell music, we're going to say, sorry, you can't do that. I predict 2024 in the West will be just like 2020, but even worse, with more drama and chaos everywhere. I, I would predict that, too. Every year it gets worse. Every year this shit gets worse, guys. Make a change. Either look at moving out or set up an internet, at least set up an international backup plan, www.caleb.top slash go to get your residency. At least you have somewhere to go if something really bad happens to your country, which it will if you live in the collapsing trifecta. America, Canada, Europe. Australia, you might be okay. Australia, New Zealand, you might be all right, maybe. But you live in Europe? What the fuck are you doing in Europe? You live in the United States? What are you doing? Oh, God. I don't get it. Unless you have very tiny children and you're divorced. That's the only valid excuse. Not grown children. I have grown children. That's it. Caleb, how soon is not just five flags, but five planets? <laughs> well, it'd be Cybertron, Coruscant, Mars, um... It's not a cool planet name from a um, um, Vormir. <laughs> I've always had a fascination on the prospects of international travel. How soon can we expect such a time to live on other worlds? If if you live a long time, you'll be able to do something on the moon and Mars, maybe, and that's the best you're going to get. Sorry. We, we lived in the wrong era for that. Sorry about that. Um, that's the best you could hope for. Is maybe you could do some shit on the moon when you're very, when you're, when you and I are very old men. Maybe do some shit on the moon. Maybe do some shit on Mars. Even that's not as likely. In our lifetimes, there are many things that'll happen in our lifetimes, but probably not that. So, sorry. What happened to the right-wing creative people in the media? They quit in disgust or got, or got fired. And they all work for Ben Shapiro now. He's making his own Snow White movie. <laughs> you know what's going to save America, conservatives? Ben Shapiro's Snow White movie. That'll fight the woke people. That'll take America back. Everyone's so, all the all the hardcore like Republicany, Trumpy. Oh, Ben Shapiro's movie. It's Snow White. Oh. Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve is. Yeah. Okay. Great. Have you ever attended any of the Nomad Campus events? I actually have not. Um, and I have some thoughts about that, but I will not share those publicly. But I know Andrew. I've talked to him a lot, and um, I'm well aware of what he's doing, and uh, I like him. He's a nice guy. Uh, but I've never been to – well, wait a minute. Have I, no, I have not. I've been to similar events, but not any of those. Every time he he does one of those big things, it's always in a place I can't go because I'm always on the side of the planet. and you know, yeah. Have I spent any time in Buenos Aires? Significant time, yes. <clears throat> Thought it's been a few few months, a year there, winters. Um, you can read my whole article I did about it on my blog, killjones.com to search for Argentina. I do a whole deep dive on Buenos Aires. Cool place to live, excuse me, cool place to visit. I wouldn't want to live there because I was actually looking many years ago at living there. Can't live there too chaotic. But a cool place to hang out, great place this winter. Yeah, it's a really interesting city. It's almost a very unique city. So it's a really cool, cool place. I wouldn't live there. Too much chaos. Paraguay is right next to it. I would totally live in Paraguay. Hell yes. Although Paraguay is very boring. So if you're young and cool and want to hang out with girls and, and made a bunch of friends and go clubbing and don't go to Paraguay, you'll be bored. Go to Buenos Aires. Or you better go to fucking Sao Paulo or something like that. What do you what do you think is the future of movies and entertainment? Every movie is flopping now, and it seems like it's becoming outdated entertainment like radios. Um, here's my guess. <clears throat> Mainstream Hollywood will continue to get worse. It'll implode on itself. Uh, they will not learn their lesson. They won't. It'll keep getting worse. What will probably happen, which is exciting, and I've mentioned this before, it's going to be a few years, via AI and other technologies, you will see independent filmmakers be able to make good shit. There are some fan-made Star Wars movies, and they're like, you know, five minutes, ten minutes long, that are fucking amazing. Now, there are a lot of them that are stupid. But there's, there are some, there are, those of you who are nerds, you know this, 
There are entire Star Trek shows with multiple seasons on the internet, 100% fan made, and they're great. They're fantastic because they're made by people who actually give a shit about the source material and not a bunch of woke left wingers run by studio heads that don't know anything. So what you have now is you have people who hate the source material. We know this for a fact. Star Wars, J.J. Abrams, Kathleen Kennedy, these are people who hated the original, uh, excuse me, Star Trek. Star Trek is written by people now who hate the original Star Trek. Doctor Who is written by people now who hated the original Doctor Who. The Witcher, the TV show, written by people, we know for a fact, they said it on the record, who hated the books. They thought they were stupid. Okay? Indiana Jones, all these things. Whereas when you have fans making these things, they give a shit and it's good. Now, they don't have the budget, <clears throat> but soon they will have the budget. It'll be cheap enough via AI and other things to make really good fan-made movies or independent films that are awesome. You'll be able to make soon your own space opera with special effects equivalent to Star Wars. You guys, have, you guys, you nerdy guys, you've seen the Axonar, the Axonar Star Trek fan made. It's the special effects are fucking amazing. They're great. And it's super accurate to the canon. It's great stuff. So you see more of that down the road <clears throat> until then or forever. Hollywood will get worse and worse and worse. The thing that killed Hollywood, the catalyst that killed Hollywood, was the removal of mid-budget movies. The reason the 80s was so awesome, and the 70s too, for movies, because you had mid-budget movies, movies that today would cost between 30 million and 50 million. Those are the best movies. These movies that cost 200 million suck, with rare exception, they're exceptions. They suck ass. The Marvels was like $270 million. So was Ant-Man, Quantumania, and Indiana Jones was like 300 million. Terrible. Okay. Now, you don't want $5 million movies, but you know what was a good movie a while ago was um, The Invisible Man. It's like a $30 million movie. It's a great movie. $30 million bucks because it's $30 million bucks. When you have $30 million bucks, you give a shit. When you're spending $300 million, you don't, you're like, ah, and there's 14 executives involved. It's a big fucking movie. <clears throat> All right. Differences between Uruguay and Paraguay. When Resident Evil Course in Uruguay. We're trying for next year. That is on the agenda for next year. We're trying. Difference. Uruguay is much more advanced on the socioeconomic economic ladder than Paraguay. Paraguay, you're kind of roughing it. Uruguay is much more close to like Armenia, Mexico, uh, Buenos Aires, that level. <clears throat> so a much more normal feel. But similar in terms of people are chill and relaxed. Also, Uruguay, you have a beach, you have water. You don't have, you don't have a beach in, in Paraguay. You have, a, you have a river and you have lakes. You don't have, you have an ocean. So you have that. Um, <clears throat> better banking and things like that in Uruguay. So economically superior. That's, that's a big difference. Uruguay's great. Hypothetical question. Let's say you got diagnosed with, I love hypotheticals. These are my favorite. Let's say you got diagnosed with cancer. It's real and relevant. Yeah, that'd be real and relevant. I would not have a second opinion. Yeah. And your chances of dying is definitely more than 2%. What would you do? Wouldn't you be emotional when it happened? Yes, I would be emotional when I got the news. I'd be emotional for a day or two, and then I'd get to work. That's me, though. Most people would, would like, break down and cry and freak out and ruin their, they get depressed. And I've known people got cancer. Um, it's, yeah, it's horrible, emotionally. I'm not like that. I would be emotional for a, maybe two or three days. I'm like, all right. I'd sit down. I'd do the research. I'd call the experts. I'd say, what do I got to do to beat this thing? Let's roll. And i get to work. That's what I would do. I've had many scenarios in my life, including several this year, where a problem came up and I was like pissed off for a day or two or three or irritated or frustrated. I'm like, all right, what do I got to do? Let's get to work. Let's go. Let's fix it. Because I want to live. That's how I would handle it. All right. Um, should we wrap it up? I'll give you a few more seconds to type questions because I know there's a delay sometimes www.caleb.top slash go to get your residency, which is less expensive. And now you can make payments and you could go whatever you want. Mexico, Dubai, Paraguay, Armenia. If you are curious, I mentioned this before, the number one country we do by far that you guys like is Paraguay. Paraguay gets way more. We got way more people doing Paraguay than, I mean, than any of the other three. We get the other three too, but Paraguay is really popular. 
and we've driven that price down a lot, and now you can make payments. And we've we've really we've really shored up the Paraguay program because that's our biggest one. But Dubai, we got people right here down doing Dubai. You save more taxes with Dubai, depending on what you're doing. Armenia, Mexico, depending on the part of the world you want to be in, depending on what your goals are for taxes, lifestyle. Those four countries are different at where we cover the gamut of whatever you want. We have less expensive. We have more expensive. We have uh, Western, Eastern, sorry, uh, Eastern Hemisphere, Western Hemisphere. One is kind of in Europe, Armenia. We have the whole, cover the whole planet. And yes, we will add Uruguay as soon as we can. My hope is next year. Next year, I'm going to be a little busy. It's going to be the greatest year of my life. So I'll be a little busy. But one thing would be make it great is we add Uruguay. <laughs> So I'll be spending a few months in Paraguay. I'll, I can pop over to Uruguay. It's just an hour flight. So, yeah. How much do you, money do you recommend making before moving to a country? <clears throat> I don't know what your expenses are. I don't know. Are you single? If you're single and have no kids and are living in a lower lower end country, two thousand a month is all you need. <clears throat> If you want to have a cool car and a cool apartment, you're married, you have four kids, and you're going to move to Dubai, a lot. Depends what your lifestyle is. Are you concerned of 5G when traveling? This is another great example of is it real, is it relevant, 2% rule. I've done the research. No, I don't give a fuck about 5G, and neither should you. Be rational. Cedula seems like the golden ticket to operate in all the surrounding countries without the headache. Yes. When you get Paraguay Cedula, which you get with residency, it's an extra, extra piece under your residency, you can use that Cedula to go to all of the ASEAN countries, not ASEAN, um, Mercosur. ASEAN is Southeast Asia. Mercosur countries, and you don't even need a passport. You just flash your Cedula and they let you in. Awesome. Really fucking cool. If you want to hit South America as a region for the rest of your life, Get Paraguay residency, add Cedula, which is another piece onto the residency. Get that done. Boom. Get, get and Wait a year, get your permanent residency, and you have that Cedula in your pocket. You go to most Latin countries, most of them, without a passport. It's awesome. And I don't know how, how it works for Visa, how long you can stay there, but it's awesome. Yeah. Yep. Is a good mission to want to teach <clears throat> African Americans about crypto and financial independence. That's not niche enough, but that's fine. It may seem flimsy to outsiders since Bitcoin goes in and out of fashion so regularly. Well, you do you said crypto, not Bitcoin. Bitcoin will go away someday, but we'll always have crypto. So that's fine. Sure. Can teaching violin or musical instrument a skill that can be niched for a little? I I would avoid it. The, the best you can do with teaching a musical instrument is you narrow down to a very wealthy niche. So teaching violin to the children of ultra-wealthy Chinese parents who are sending their kids to Harvard to be a famous da-da-da-da, who are willing to pay $1,000. If you can't do that, pick a different niche. Too hard. I looked at a lot of land through Century 21, but no reply. <laughs> Century 21? <laughs> Don't talk talk to another real estate agent. Fuck. What is the criteria for going to a temporary residency to permanent residency in Paraguay? You wait two years. That's it. Get temporary residency, wait a year. Or wait two years. It's one or two years. I keep forgetting. There's so many countries in my head. You just, you get your temporary, you wait a year, and you get permanent. Or one or two years. Mexico works the same way. That's it. There's no criteria. Just wait. The criteria is you need temporary residency. That's it. Caleb.top slash go. Get your residency, go down there whenever you want, cheap as fuck, and you're in. All right, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, all right, one more question. I have a car, but don't really need it. No kids, no wife, no debt. Do you think 3.5K a month is enough to move to Dubai? Yes. Go watch my Dubai video on this on this, this channel, Sovereign CEO, where I talk about do you have to be rich, how much does it cost to live in Dubai, I go through all the numbers. Yes. If you're willing to be a little flexible, you could easily live in Dubai for three and a half K USD a month. No problem. This apartment I'm in, I got an amazing view in a brand new building in downtown, the coolest part of town. 
1700 bucks a month USD. Now it's a very tiny apartment and you could get, you could slash that in half if you didn't need to be in a really cool part of town and didn't give a shit about a view and you didn't give a shit about a new building. You get 900 a month. For this You get this apart for 900 a month. 800 a month? Yeah. And it's not even a suit. It's a single bedroom. I'll do a YouTube video, so I'll do a walkthrough with it. It's pretty small. I'm, I'm treating it like an office where I sleep. <laughs> All right. On the is it relevant part, what if it's not relevant at the moment, but it has risk of potential to be relevant sometime in the future? Is it a 2%? What, it, what is the probability? Like I when I'm wearing a seatbelt. If I get in a car... Am I going to get in a car accident in that on that drive, on that day? No. Will I over a period of 45 years? Yes, so I put on my seatbelt. So what is the time frame? What's the time span? What are the odds? And be rational. Don't let your feeling, well, I might, well, if this happens, this will be bad. That's all emotional speak. What is the statistical probability over what span of time? That's it. Not like, well, geez, if I jump out, you jump out of an airplane, you have a parachute. What are the what is the statistical probability you're gonna die? Well, I'm gonna die. What's the statistical probability you're gonna die? It's less than two percent. Go do it. I might do it next year for my birthday. Pink Firefly will panic because she doesn't follow these rules. She's emotional, like many of you. She says, but you might die. <laughs> the consequences are not relevant. What is relevant is the probability the consequences, consequences will occur over the specified time frame. Irrelevant of the consequences. And I and it's hard for people to emotionally do this because they want to be emotional about this shit. Yeah. All right, cool guys. I will see you if you want to talk about other topics. The Alpha Two Point live stream is on Wednesday at the same time. So whatever this time was, eleven a.m. EST, whatever that is. Cool, cool. All right, bye.